So today we are coming to continue our discussion and uh, we are going to be looking at one of the important standards for corporate reporting and also financial reporting, and that is financial instruments. So today we'll be looking at maybe the definition of financial instruments classification. Then we look at financial liability. Then we will stop there. Then tomorrow we look at convertible instruments, then financial assets, then impairment of financial assets. Then we look at what we call a factory and also disposal of financial assets. Then we look at loan modification. That is also uh, one of the, the loan, modifi the loan modification is the technical side of the standard that can be examined in corporate reporting, but for financial reporting, I don't think so. Okay, so we'll be looking at what we call financial instruments, maybe the definition, although they cannot ask you, but they can ask you some theory questions that you have to use your understanding of financial instrument to classify that particular instrument. So let's look at the so we look at the IFRS nine financial instruments, although the the standards are three. The one that we are going to be look at, we are going to be looking at more is the is the nine. Okay. So the first thing is we have to look at what we call financial instruments. What is a financial instrument? Okay. Okay. Financial instruments. Okay. What do we call a financial instrument? Okay. Someone can basically say that financial instrument is any instrument that can be traded or is any instrument that is tradable. Or someone can say financial instrument is a contract between two people in monetary what values. Any instrument that can be traded, traded as well. It can be on the stock exchange market. It can be in the security market, or any instrument that is giving rise to financial liability of another entity or a financial asset of uh one entity. So any instrument that will give rise to financial liability or financial asset of uh, one entity or another entity, we say that is a financial instrument. That is what the standard is saying, that financial instrument is, uh, is any instrument or any contract, is any contract that gives rise to a financial asset of one entity and a financial liability or equity of another entity. So what are those items that can be traded or what are those items that can give a financial or that can give rise to a financial asset of one entity and a financial liability of another entity? So those, those instruments that can be traded on the stock exchange market, basically we can say that they are the financial instruments. So the debentures, the shares, all those things are what we call the financial instruments. But the standard is saying that the financial instruments is any contract that will give rise to what? Financial assets of one entity and a financial liability or equity of another entity. So basically the standard is saying that financial instruments can be a financial liability of one entity and a financial asset of what another entity. It depends on who is issuing. The person who is issuing the instrument, we treat it as a financial liability because someone is going to buy the item and you have the right to, what, to pay that particular person back or to pay interest on that particular instrument or you have a contractual 
uh, obligation to settle the interest or any cash relating to that particular instrument. So that is what we call the financial liability. If you have a contractual obligation under the terms of what the instrument, you have to classify it as a financial liability. But there's no cash obligation attached to that particular instrument. You don't have to what, uh, pay interest, you don't have to redeem, or you don't have to pay the principal to the person at the end of the maturity period. That particular instrument should be treated as what, financial assets. Okay, let's come to examples of instruments that can be classified as a financial liability. So if you issue debentures, if you issue bonds, if you issue other any what instrument that can be traded, that particular one will be classified as what financial liability because you are the one issuing. The people will buy and their money will be with you. You have an obligation towards them. Therefore, that particular instrument should be classified as a financial liability. But let's come to what we call the financial assets. Financial assets will be investment in shares, investment in debentures, investment in bonds, all those things will be the financial assets. So financial asset or liability, it is from the perspective of who is what, who is issuing or who is buying. So the issuer, the issuer will always classify the instrument as a financial liability. But the buyer will classify the instrument as what? As a financial asset because he is the one buying. So that will be an Risa, Yes, please. Chris, can you go over the examples for me? The examples can be financial liability can be issuing of debentures, bonds, Issue of debentures, bonds, and other securities. Financial assets will be investment in any of these ones. So if you are investing in any of these securities, you are going to classify it as a financial asset. All right. So let's come to the... Let's come to IS32. That talks about classification. List. The classification is very important because it is going to affect the calculation of your earnings per share, which we are going to be looking at the next topic. Okay. Which will be which we are going to be looking at as the next standard. Okay. The classification will go a long way to to affect your what your any special calculation. So you have to pay uh, very much attention to the classification. All right. <clears throat> the standard is saying that you can classify the instrument as a financial liability or liability instrument, or you can classify it as equity instrument. Basically, what are they saying? You can classify the instrument as a debt instrument or equity instrument so this can be a debt instrument or equity instrument linos linos yes please uh please so does it mean that you are done with the ifrs 9 so you are now on different uh, is 32 the 32 is part of the the financial instrument the financial instrument is having four standards Okay. So the 32 is only about the classification. How do you classify the instrument? That is what we are coming to look at. So how do you classify the instrument? That is what we are going to be looking at. Okay. Okay. So the 32 is saying that the instrument should either be classified, the financial instrument should either be classified as debt instrument or financial liability or equity instruments. What are the conditions? What are the conditions that to necessitate the instrument or that will make the instrument to be classified as debt instrument or equity instrument? Please, this classification is very important, especially if you are calculating any special. Okay. So we are coming to debt instruments. 
a financial instrument should be classified as debt instrument if the entity has what? Uh, cash obligation. If the entity has cash obligation to settle, uh, to settle the the terms using. Okay, if the entity has an obligation to settle maybe whatever instrument by delivering cash or exchange what another instrument with that particular instrument under the terms that are not favorable to what to the entity. So whenever the instrument is given a, an obligation or cash obligation to the entity, or the entity has an obligation to deliver cash or exchange a financial asset or equity instrument. Uh, it returns for this one under conditions that are not favorable to the entity. We say that that is what that particular instrument is a debt instrument or is a financial liability. So if the entity has what a cash obligation, there is an obligation that the entity must settle this particular instrument using cash or using another financial instrument under the terms that are not favorable to the entity. What do you mean by cash obligation? If you issue debentures, you have an obligation to pay interest at the end of every year. Whether profit is being made or not, you have to pay the interest. These particular debentures will be redeemable. It means that for at, a, at the end of a particular period of time, you are going to pay the money back to those people. So these are the obligations that we are talking about. You have the what? the obligation to pay interest on that particular instrument at the end of every year, regardless of whether you are making profit or not. And you are also going to be what? You are also going to be, you're also going to be redeeming or paying back the principal to them at the end of a particular period. Okay, so for this one, because of this, we have issues like redeemable preferences. Redeemable preferences will be, will be classified as what? As debt instruments. Okay, they are going to be having, they are going to be, the company is going to be paying dividends to them and the company also will be paying back their what? Their capital to them at the end of a particular period. Okay, so if we are talking about debt instruments, we can say that all what redeemable instruments are debt instruments. Why? Because the entity has an obligation to pay the principal to them at a particular period of time. And that is what? That is a debt obligation. That is a liability. As soon as you have an obligation to settle a certain amount of money at a particular period of time, that is a liability. So all redeemable instruments are classified as what? As liability. All redeemable instruments are classified as liability and all cumulative instruments, all cumulative instruments are also classified as what? As a debt instrument. What do you mean by cumulative? If you come to cumulative preferences, you see you have the obligation that even if profit is not, uh, you are not able to pay the dividend for this particular year, you pay the dividend in the subsequent year together with what? With this year's own. This cannot happen to what? Equity shareholders. Equity instruments, you only declare dividends when there is what? There is profit. But situation where even if there is no profit or dividend has not been declared, you pay the dividend together with the current dividend. You pay the previous dividend together with the current dividend. That, part, that particular issue is that particular instrument is having the what the characteristics of what debt instrument because equity instrument in terms of dividend payment. No, if dividend is not declared for this year or if profit is not, if you are not able to make profit, we are not declaring dividends. We cannot pay this this particular year's dividend together with any dividend that we are going to be declaring in the future. No, or we are going to be paying in the future. No. So all redeemable instruments are treated as what? Debt instruments. All cumulative instruments are treated as what? Debt instruments.
Okay, so under this particular one, the company is having cash obligation or the company is having obligation to deliver cash, then that is why we redeemable preferences will be treated as debt instruments and cumulative preferences will be treated as debt instruments. The benches and all those ones, bonds, the benches, they are going to be treated as what debt instruments. So don't see preferences in the question and saying that preferences should be part of equity. No, preferences does not give ownership and preferences is not having a characteristics of equity. Unless the preferences is having a characteristics of equity, that is the only time that you can treat it as equity instrument. Okay, let's come to when should an instrument be classified as equity instrument? The instrument should be classified as equity instrument if the entity has no what obligation to deliver cash. The entity has no obligation to deliver cash in the future or at a particular period of time. So we don't have any obligation to settle the instruments at, at the end of a particular period. So for this reason, irredeemable preferences, irredeemable preferences are treated as what? Irredeemable preferences are treated as equity instruments. Why? Because they are going to be with the entity forever. They are going to be, these years are going to be with the entity forever, which is having the same characteristics as what? As equity. Equity instruments, unless the entity wants to buy those, those particular shares back, they are going to be with the entity forever. So the irredeemable preferences, they are also going to be with the entity forever. So they are having a characteristic of what? Equity instruments. So therefore, their dividends are treated in what? In statement of changes in equity. But a redeemable preferences and cumulative one, their dividends are treated as finance costs. They are treated as what? Uh, finance costs. Someone will say finance costs. Someone will say finance costs. It depends on where you are coming from. Okay. If you come to non-cumulative, you also see a question like non-cumulative. If you see non-cumulative, so the irredeemable preferences, it should be classified as equity instrument because of duration. It is going to be there forever. And equity instruments are also going to be there forever. But let's come to non-cumulative. You see a question like non-cumulative what preferences. Non-cumulative means that if you are not able to pay dividend for this year, this dividend will not be paid together with what? With the subsequent dividend. This is now being seen as what? Equity instrument. Because equity instrument, there is no profit, no dividend. The same way, no cumulative, there is no profit, there is no dividend. So you can see that it is behaving as what? As equity instrument in terms of dividend payment. So non-cumulative preferences will also be treated as what? Non-cumulative preferences will also be treated like an equity instrument. Please, they are not giving ownership, but just that their dividends are being treated as what? As, as if it is an equity instrument. So these, their dividends will not be taken away from the profit or loss. That is why if you are calculating any special, you always have to take out the redeemable preferences because we are looking for any attributable to what to the shareholders. Okay, you also see we are still on the preferences. This is a special case for the preferences. Okay, so you have to know how the preferences are being classified. Redeemable cumulative are classified as debt instruments and their dividends are treated as what finance costs, they are treated as interest in the profit or loss accounts. Okay, you can also see something like participating you can also see something like participating participating preferences participating preferences if they say participating what 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 is the meaning the preference shareholders are going to be participating participating in what that is a question so you can see that if we are coming to those annual meetings and all those things, that will be those board meetings and all those uh, annual general meetings which will be held by shareholders, the preference shareholders will also be part. But in that, that particular meeting is for only the owners. 
the debt holders will not be there. It's only the owners that will come for that uh, board meeting or annual meeting. Or they are also going to be participating in the voting. They are also going to be having a voting right. The voting right is given to only the owners of the company. So the question considered the preference share is a participating preference share. It means that they are going to be having a voting right and they are also going to be participating in the decision making and all those meetings. In that case, the preference, the preference share should also be treated as what? Equity instruments because they are having the same rights, they are having the same characteristics as what? As equity shareholders. But if they say it is non participate, it is non participatory, it should be treated as what? It is non participatory, it should be treated as debt instrument. So if you pick the instrument, if you pick the instrument, just see whether the instrument is having the characteristics of what depth or is having the characteristics of what equity. You see the equity shareholders are the owners of the entity and the entity has no obligation to pay these people back in the future. No, they are going to be with the company forever unless the people want to what, want to sell their shares. If they want to sell their shares, the company will now have what we call treasury shares that is used to uh buy back their shares so if the question is giving you treasury shares it means that a company is buying back some of what its shares and this should be taken away from the what the equity no gain or loss should be recognized on that we look at that under any special okay so look at the dividend payments look at the interest are we supposed to pay interest every year if we are not able to pay the dividends are we taking it are we accumulating it you have to look at those things. Dividend payment, the duration. If you are, if the instrument is going to be with the entity forever, equity. If the entity will only pay interest when profit is being made, that is equity. But if the instrument is not going to be with the entity forever, debt. If the entity has what? Obligation, a fixed obligation to pay interest at the end of every year, or this particular interest or dividend can also be accumulated. That is debt. So if you look at the instrument, you have to what you have to uh, uh, study the instrument very well and know whether it should be classified as equity or it should be classified as what as debt. You also be seeing things like uh, convertible and non-convertible. Okay, we look at that one also later. Okay, so this is about a classification. The 32 is only talking about a classification. Please, before instruments should be classified as a financial instrument, the instrument should be having uh, or should be given a right to what contractual what uh, cash flow. So you cannot place a bet and you'll be saying that you are going to classify the bet as what as a financial instrument. No. This, de this bet will not give you interest. This bet will not give you any amount because it is it is based on speculations. It can, you can lose or you can win. Okay, so, and the uh, cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrencies should also not be classified as what? As a financial instrument. Because for the cryptocurrency, it is not giving you any uh, right to contractual cash flows. Or it's not giving you a contractual right to cash flows. You are not going to be receiving any interest on that. And the amount is not even what fixed. You are not going to get any cash flow from that. The only thing is that the, the price will be increasing and be reducing. Nobody is going to pay you interest. Nobody is going to pay you dividends on the what? On the cryptocurrency. The only time you receive cash is when you dispose the item. Okay. So for financial instruments, they sh it should be giving you a right to a contractual cash flow. Either interest or dividends. It can be paid at any time, but you should have a right to what? A return on the investment that you are making. So the return can be in form of interest, it can be in form of dividend. All right. So we are coming to look at financial liability. Financial liability. Okay. So we are saying that if the entity financial liability, we are saying that if the entity 
has an obligation to deliver cash or exchange. Okay. Some people, they will be saying that the instrument is being classified based on uh, based on substance over form. Okay. It is based on who is the, or who is what uh, enjoying the economic benefits rather than the what, who is the legitimate what owner. It's just like leases. Okay. So let's come to financial liability. What do we call financial liability? We say that when the entity uh, has an obligation to deliver cash or to exchange another financial instrument under conditions that are not favorable to the entity. Okay, let me come here. Let me come here. Let me come to the. Let me come to the this one again. The classification again. Okay, sometimes you can also see. You can also see. Let's come here. You see the redeemable preferences. The cumulative preferences, the non-participatory, the non what, uh, the convertible and non-convertible. Sometimes these these particular items can come with options. Okay, these things can come with options. They can come with options, and you ask yourself, who is calling for the redemption? The option means who is calling for the uh, the redemption, or the option means that the right will be attached to. The instrument, whether to con whether to whether to redeem or not to redeem. So you ask yourself, who is calling for the option? Who has the right to call for the option? If it is the buyer who is calling for the option, it means that the buyer will always call for redemption. So you are the owner of the instrument, and you have the right to call for redemption. You have the right to tell the entity that they should pay the amount to you. Yes, you are always going to call for that particular option because if the company is not doing well, you would like to what? You want the company to pay you back. So if it is the buyer that is calling for the option, then the instrument will still be classified as that instrument. But if it is redeemable and it is carrying an option, and it is the seller or the entity that is having the option, it means that the entity will never call for the option because they, if they call for it, they are going to pay cash. And the entity will not call for it because why? They don't want to pay cash. They can use that particular cash to do whatever they want to do. So the instrument can be redeemable, but it will be what? It will be carrying an option. Option will be attached to it. And you ask yourself, who has the right to exercise this particular option? If it is a buyer, then it is a debt instrument because the redeemable is possible. But if it is a seller, who is the entity, it means that this redemption is not possible. The entity will never call for the option because if they call for it, they are going to be paying cash. And that will make the instrument irredeemable. And that will be classified as that as equity instrument rather so you have to pay very much attention to that okay so after identifying that the instrument is a financial liability or is a debt instrument and therefore it should be classified as a financial liability in the books of the issuer how do you account for this okay the financial liability is just like a normal liability, but since it's an instrument, that is why we are adding financial to the liability. Okay, so from our basic understanding, we know that a liability will either be a current liability, will either be a current liability, or a non-current what liability. Okay, that is from our basic understanding. We know that classification of liability will either be a current liability or non-current liability. The same thing that is, up, that is applied over here. So the instrument will be classified as either a current liability or non-current liability, but we don't call it current liability and non-current what liability. So we say that the instrument will be classified or de designated through profit or loss. True profit or loss, we are going to look at that through the instrument will be designated or classified or financial instrument or financial liability uh, classified to profit or loss to profit or loss True profit or loss, they are just saying that it's just a short term what? 
uh, instrument. It's a short-term instrument. So we assume that it will be paid or it will be repaid within a what within a year. That's why they are saying through profit or loss. Profit or loss, we only send what items that are what of uh revenue nature, they are of recurrence nature. Those items that their benefits will be consumed within a year. Those are the items that we send to what profit or loss. Items that are going to be for a year. They are just there for a year. Okay, so. The second one is not classified to not classified financial instrument, not classified to profit or loss. Not classified to profit or loss. And that will be the non current liability. Not classified to profit or loss means that this instrument is going to be with the entity for more than a year. Okay, that is the meaning. And that is be the non current liability. The classification of the liability depends on what? The duration. The duration and then the purpose. Cool. So the question can tell you that we are classifying this for, or we are holding this particular instrument for speculative what? purposes. It means that any at any point in time, we can sell. So if they say speculative purposes, that is true profit or loss. It's for trading purposes. Okay, they can also tell you that the entity is holding this particular instrument up to maturity. It means that if the maturity period is four years, we are going to have it up to what? Up to the four years. So the classification depends on the duration of the instrument. The classification depends on the duration of the what? Of the instrument. Okay. Let's come here. We are saying that this particular instrument is, is a financial liability and it is classified through profit or loss, not through profit or loss. If it's a debenture that we are issuing, how much are we going to attach to the debenture? We know that we have issued a debenture. How much? If you are going to recognize a debenture in your books at the time of the issuing, how much are you going to attach to the debenture? That is what we are coming to look at now as the initial recognition. Initial recognition is at the time of what issuing. What are the entries that you are going to be making in your books? You'll be having debenture or you'll be having cash. How much are you going to enter as cash and how much are you going to be entering in the liabilities book as what? As debenture. How much are you going to be attaching to this particular transaction? So we are coming to look at initial recognition. You see, you are going to issue this and people will pay for it. So you are going to receive an amount. It is likely possible that when you are going to be issuing this, you can incur what we call issuing costs. You can pay brokers, agents to get the, what, the buyer for you. And that will be a, what an issuing cost or a transaction cost. How do you account for it? If you are going to issue debenture, it might happen that you issue the debenture and incur cost. If you are going to issue preferences, we give preferences, you are going to incur cost. What if you are doing this one through underwriters? You are giving the shares to people to sell for you. What if the people are demanding for what? Prospectus. You have to publish it. You have to print the prospectus for them. And all those things are costs that you are incurring because you want to what? Sell the preferences. How do you go with this cost? How do you treat them? Okay. The treatment of the cost depends on the treatment or the classification of the instrument itself. Okay, so let's say that we are classifying the instrument through profit or loss. Let's say we are classifying the instrument through profit or loss. Okay, if you are classifying the instrument through profit or loss, what do we do? If you are, if you are classifying the instrument through profit or loss, what happened is that let's assume that the entity, uh, so it was the benches and we, the debentures were sold for 10,000. Okay. The debentures were sold for 10,000. And the question is giving you issue cost. Issue cost. Issue cost of, let's see, 500. Or oh, they are also saying that this has been issued at a discount. This has been issued at a discount. A discount of maybe ten percent. Okay, and this particular 
ten percent will also give you thousand. Okay, so we are classifying the instrument through profit or loss. It means that this particular amount will be paid within a year. This particular amount will be paid within a year. If this particular amount will be paid within a year, it means that any related cost will also be consumed within a year. Because if you are buying assets, if you are buying assets and you incur delivery costs, what do we do? If you are, if you purchase an asset and you incur a delivery cost, what is the treatment or the delivering cost? We, we capitalize it. Okay, what is the what is the what is the assumption or the perception about capitalizing the delivering cost? That the set will be used for a longer period. Okay, we are incurring the delivering cost on asset that is going to be there for a particular number of period, isn't it? So the delivery cost is also said to be what to be consumed over. The, what, the benefit of the delivery cost is also said to be consumed over the useful life of the asset. Since we are incurring this particular cost on an asset that is going to last for 10 years, it means that the benefit that we are going to be getting from delivery cost should also be spread over the useful life of the asset. That is why we add a delivery cost. Okay. The same way apply or the same principle applies to what? The classification of the direct cost relating to financial what? Uh, instruments applies to financial instruments. We are saying that a financial instrument is true profit or loss. It means that it will be paid within a year. It means that the benefit of this cost must also be what consumed within what a year. So if the benefits are consumed within a year, it means that they will go to profit or loss. So if the instrument is classified through profit or loss, any transaction cost, any discounts, all those things should be expensed to profit or loss because the instrument will last for only a year and the benefit of those particular costs must also be consumed within a year. Must also be consumed within a year. So if you are classifying the instrument through profit or loss, classified through profit or loss, Classified to profit or loss, transaction cost or issuing cost, any other cost, any other direct cost, transaction cost, uh, discount, any other direct cost should be what expensed. Should be expense uh, to profit or loss. Okay, why? Because we are incurring this particular cost in respect of an item that will last for only a year. It means that we can't capitalize these items because they are for just a year. And our financial year is just a year, it's one year. So it means that the benefits have been consumed already, unless the financial instrument. So if the financial instrument is being issue maybe six months six months to the year okay that one you can have a justification that okay the instrument maybe if the instrument will be there for a year you can say that okay then let's just uh take only what six months but since we don't have when this particular insert uh financial instrument will be will be repeat whether the instrument is being issued six months to the year or not. The instrument can be paid before the year will end. We can redeem it before the year will end. So you have to now take the transaction cost to what? Or the discount to profit or loss. It doesn't depend on the duration unless the company is saying that the instrument is going to be there uh, for a year. If it is for the year, then you, you also say, okay, you have done only six months. So the cost will vary, but they will not be telling you that thing in the exam. They will just tell you the instrument is classified to profit or loss. So the instrument can be repaid at any time. You can issue it maybe the next day or the next month. It has been what? It has been sold to a different person. So the transaction cost or the discount will always be what? Will always be uh, expensed. Okay. Let's come to the instrument not classified to profit or loss.
not classified to profits or loss. Okay. Not classified to profit or loss. You always have to look at the duration of the words of the instruments. You always have to look at the duration of the instruments. So this will last for maybe three years, four years, five years. Okay. So if the instrument, the debenture, the debenture is for 10,000 and you are having an issuing cost or the issue cost. So let's say this will go for four years. And this will be for the discount, which is 10% will be for, will be, this will be for 500 and this will be for 1000. Okay. This issuing cost and discount are relating to instrument that is for four years. What is the most appropriate way of what accounting for the issuing cost and also the discount? It is in get in relation to what an item that will last for what? Four years. What is the appropriate way of accounting for this particular instrument? Should we expense all the amount of profit or loss, or we spread the what the the benefits or the cost over the what over the the life of the instrument? What is the most appropriate way of accounting for this? We have to spread it. Okay. So if you want to spread it, it means that you are capitalizing what the cost. Because the cost is for four years. So the benefit must be spread over what? Over the four years. Okay. The benefit must be must be uh spread over four years. Okay. The, the accounting for this, okay. If you are having, if you are having, okay, the most appropriate way is that you are going to be having transaction costs, okay. You are having transaction costs, so we can put the two together. The discount and this one to be one thousand five hundred. Okay, the most appropriate way is that this is an expense. So if you are capitalizing on expense, that will be an asset. If you are capitalizing, if you are capitalizing the an expense, that will be an asset. Okay, then you have. You are going to be having a debenture itself. You are going to be having a debenture itself, and you'll be having the the ten thousand. That will be a liability. Count to count to this. This should be the treatment. Okay. You are going to if you count your cash book. This is all your cash or bank account. This is what you are going to be having. You'll be having a debenture. You'll be having a debenture of 10,000. Then you'll be having issuing cost of 500. Then you'll be having a discount of what? Of 1,000. Okay. It means that the only amount that you are receiving from this transaction is what? 8,500. Okay. But that is not a problem. Okay. The actual treatment should be this one. We have the transaction cost and we also have the debenture. Okay, but what is going to happen in the exam? Whatever be the case, the debenture, the nominal value of the debenture is 10,000 and the interest will be paid on 10,000. So the debenture is carrying an interest of 10%. It means that in the profit or loss, we are going to be having interest of 1,000. Then we'll also be having the transaction cost, which will be the amortization of the transaction cost. And that will be 1,500 divided by four. Okay, what are we have? 1,500 divided by four. That should be 375. Okay, that will be 375. So this is a profit that will be recognized in the statement of financial, in the statement of profit or loss for the first year of the issue. Okay, but what is going to happen? is that the question will always give you effective interest rates. The question will always give you effective interest rates. What do you mean by effective interest rates? Okay, they will give you a rate that will take into consideration the 1,000 and also the 375. So they will give you effective interest rates. If you are given effective interest rates, then you ask yourself, what is the net variable value I'm receiving from the issue? 
that will be 8,500 because you receive 10,000 and you have paid what? 1,500 relating to that. You are receiving 8,500. If you are giving effective interest rate, it means that the effective interest rate has taken into consideration the capitalization of the transaction cost to the liability accounts. The effective interest rate means that you are not going to be capitalizing this. You are not going to be capitalizing this as an item on its own. But since this is relating to what? Relating to an item, it should be added to that particular one. Adding means what? You are going to be subtracting because it's an asset. If you go to liability account, you'll be debiting. The liability itself will be having what? Will be having a credit account. So this is an asset now. If you want to capitalize, it means that you are going to debit in every account that you are sending this figure to. So the liability will now reduce. So the liability will now be 8,500. But in actual sense, your interest should be 1,000 every year. Your capitalization of the transaction cost will be 375. But the effective interest rate given to you has been calculated on the residual value. So the effective interest rate given to you means that if you apply it on the residual value, it will still take care of what these two items. Okay. So if you are giving effective interest rate, the treatment of the transaction cost depends on the what? The rate given to you. If you are giving effective interest rate in the question, it means that the effective interest rate will take care of what? The residual value. So what you do is that your initial recognition for this, the initial recognition, the initial recognition will be the purchase price or the issue price okay will be the ten thousand then any other cost this is a liability any other cost will be what will be added so this is a cost if you're adding that will be a reduction this is a liability this is no asset okay so we are having the discount should also come here as thousand okay then you have thousand you have 8,500, okay. So this is this is because we are giving what effective interest rate. So the effective, the effective interest rate has been calculated, taking into consideration the reduction. So it means that if you apply the effective interest rate on this, you will be getting the actual interest plus the what? The, the amortization of the transaction cost. But whatever be the case, the interest every year should be 10% on that particular debenture. That is the interest that you are going to be paying. The interest every year should be what? 10% on the what? On the full value. That is the interest. That is the amount that you'll be paying every year. But just that the finance cost or the interest is different because of what? The interest has included or has elements of what? The amortization of what? The transaction cost. What am I trying to see? If you are not giving effective interest rates you are giving only the nominal rate. The nominal rate is only what representing the interest on the debenture. But the expense that you'll be taking to profit or loss is not only the interest. It is going to be the amortization of the transaction cost plus the interest. So if you are giving only the nominal rate, please don't go and subtract the issuing cost and those ones because the rate given to you has not taken into consideration the amortization cost, no. So if you are giving only nominal rate, amortize this separately and also this one separately because the 10% is only talking about what this, which will be 1,000. But what about the 375? It has not been taken into consideration. So you have to capitalize that separately. But if you are giving effective interest rates, it means that the effective interest rates has been calculated to take into consideration the interest part and also the amortization part. So you have to go and what and do the correct thing. Okay. So what will happen is that that is the initial recognition for not classified through profit or loss. What will be the subsequent measurements for all of these ones? Okay. Subsequent measurements for not true profit or loss. Okay. Not true profit. True profit or loss, the subsequent measurement is the fair value. So true profit or loss. 
at the end of the year, you fair value. Okay, it should be recognized at fair value in the statement of financial position. Okay, so any increase or decrease in fair value uh, recognize decrease or increase in the fair value recognized in profit or loss. Okay, so that's what we do. True profit or loss, we just find fair value at the end of the year. We compare the value at the beginning and the value at the end. Any increase or decrease there should be recognized in profit or loss as a gain or loss. Okay, let's come to no true profit or loss. Okay, no true profit or loss. What is going to happen is that no true profit or loss. Yeah, so now Dennis. So now Dennis, I saw your hand up. Okay. So no true profit or loss, what is going to happen is that the gain for you. Is that? Is someone saying something? Okay. Let's move on. No true profit or loss. What is going to happen is that you are going to be paying maybe the same amount at the end of every year, or you are going to be paying the 10,000 at the end of five years. So what will happen is that the question will tell you that the interest, we don't do compound interest over here, it's simple interest. Okay, unless the question is saying that the interest together with what, with the principal will be paid at the end of the four years. If that is the case, then that will be compound. But you are going to be paying the interest at the end of every year. So the interest will be paid at the end of every year, or the question can say you are paying the interest at the beginning, which is not going to happen. Okay. So the interest will be paid at the end of every year. The interest will be paid at the end of every year. So what will happen is that for no profit, true profit or loss, what we have, what we do is mostly what you are going to be seeing is you have, yes, and then it's your hand is up. Uh, I'll I was asking a question about my network. So I said I was asking about the once the liability carried on the level. So I say increase or decrease is recognized in the long term. So I ask, this is a liability. Will the increase be recognized as a gain or a loss? So how are you going to recognize the increase? Okay. Increase in liability is a loss. And decrease in liability okay, so is a gain. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. So what you'll be seeing is that you have the the amount at the start. So this is the amount that we have at the start. All things being equal, what we are going to be having is that we'll be having ten thousand. Okay. Assuming we are not paying the interest, we are owing the amount that we're supposed to pay the people will be the interest, which will be 1,000. Assuming we are not paying the interest, it means that we'll be owing them 11,000. But since the interest will be paid at the end of every year, since the interest will be paid at the end of every year, it means that we add the interest and still subtract the interest. So the interest is what we call the coupon payments. We are paying them the interest, and that will still be the 1,000. Okay, so it's, you see that it will be 10,000. Okay, this is how we go with the in, we go the, with the not to profit or loss. You pay, you first, the interest will be accrued. Then, assuming that you are not paying the interest, you'll be paying what, 10,000 plus what, the 1,000. That will be the amount that you'll be paying. But you have paid the interest now. It means that the 10,000 will still be there. So, this is how we carry it. So, the end of the year, we pay the final amount. But if you're having effective interest rates, if you're having effective interest rates, Assuming the question that we have over there, then our amount over here will be 8,500. It means that it is including 
the what? The transaction cost. So the interest over here will be the effective interest rate. So the effective interest rate is just telling you that it is including the interest itself plus a portion of the amortization of the transaction cost. That is the effective, that is the finance cost that we talk about. So the finance cost is it's not only the interest. That is not the interest that we are paying on the loan. The interest that we are paying on the loan is the nominal rate on the nominal value. But because of the transaction cost, we are putting the transaction cost together with the normal interest. And we are having what? The, we are having the total amount there. So what you what you do is that, assuming they have given you uh, an effective interest rate of maybe uh, 13%. So you calculate the 13% on this one, add it. Okay. You see, included in the finance cost, included in the finance cost, there is a what? Amortization cost there. We can't pay for an amortization cost. We are only paying for the interest. We'll be paying for only the interest. And that is why we have the coupon every year. Should be on the nominal value. So subsequent measurement for not true profit or loss, we say something amortized cost. And that is the amortized cost. Some people they have been they have been using table. If you if you are doing it for more than a year or two or three, you can use the table to make it very simple. But if you are using it, if you are doing it for just a year, it will be advisable if you are using the, the vertical format. So we have the fair value. We have the fair value at the start. We have the fair value at the start. Okay. Then you have your finance cost. Finance cost, which will be the interest on the normal plus the portion of the transaction cost. Okay. Then you will now add, that will be an increment. Then we now subtract the interest itself. It will be paid interest. The interest will be paid, which we call the coupon. Which will be called the coupon. Okay. And that will be a reduction. So you have the final amount as the closing balance, which will be sent to profit or loss which will be sent to profit or loss. So this is all about the financial liability and the, let's see whether we can pick some illustration questions to like to see. Hello, sir. Yes, please. So which amount will be the closing balance of the liability for the year? Which amount will be the closing balance for? Balance for the liability, the remaining, the remaining. All the, all the liabilities to clear within that particular year. No, please. That's why I'm having close, the closing balance over here will be the liability for the year. Okay. After addition and subtraction, that will be the closing balance. Okay, let's take let's take question one and uh, okay, question one. For the financial ability, I have only two I have only three questions again. Okay, someone should read that for us. Required. In line with AIS 32, financial instruments, presentation and IFRS 9, financial instrument, set out and discuss the accounting treatment of the above issue shares within seniors financial statements for the year and the 31st March, 2021. Financial level question one, senior PLC, senior, issued 4 million cumulative redeemable preference shares 
from 1st April 2020 at their nominal value of one Ghana cities each. The shares carry a fixed dividend rate of 6%, which is payable annually in arrears. They are redeemable on 31st March 2024 yeah. at a premium of 300,000 Ghana cities. Senior issued a transaction cost on April 2020 of 1% of the issue proceeds. The effective interest rate associated with the shares is approximately 7.9%. Required. In line with IAS 32 financial instruments, presentation and IFRS 9 financial instruments, set out and discuss the accounting treatment of the above issue shares within seniors' financial statements for the year ended 31st March 2021. All right, thank you. So they are saying that it's cumulative redeemable preference share. So this is a debt instrument, isn't it? Yes, it yes. is. Okay. Please, if you are doing this, you see they can say they are telling you that the, the this thing will be redeemed at a premium, isn't it? Okay, don't stop. The premium is at the end of at the end at the redemption date. The premium is at the redemption date. And this particular 30,000, which is at the redemption date over here, it has been incorporated under the what? Or the, the effective interest rate has, has taken into consideration this particular increment. If you like, you can do it to the end of the year. You will see that the redemption amount will be the, the nominal value plus the what? The 300,000. So if you are giving a redemption, that will be or a discount. That will be at the end of the year. That has been taken into consideration before estimating the what the effective interest rates. Okay, so this one, were there any transaction costs? No. Okay, there's a transaction cost yes. of one percent. Okay, so first of all, you have to look at the what the the. So let's look at question one. That will be under senior. Here yeah, we we'll see. So we have to determine the initial recognition, very important. Okay, the question will always give you the effective interest rate. So if you are giving effective interest rate, you subtract the transaction cost from the what the amount that you are receiving. So let's look at the initial recognition there. Okay, what is the purchase price? <laughs> What will be the purchase price? The shares are we are using four million at what? City. One city. One city. That will give us four million Ghana city. Okay. So we have okay. Let's keep three zeros at the top there so that uh, that this thing can be okay. So we have three thousand. So that will be 4,000 times one. That will give you 4,000. Okay, so let's come to the issue cost or the transaction cost. Okay, the transaction cost will be what? Zero point what? Zero one. Point zero one times 4,000. Okay, and that will give us what? 40. Okay. So that will give us 40. And that will give us 3960. So that is the initial amount that we are recognizing. Okay. That is the initial amount that we are recognizing. So let's come to that is the amount at the date of the issue. That is the amount at the date of the issue. Please always take take into consideration the date. It's very important. If you if you don't take into consideration the date, you will be calculating a whole year interest while the interest should be only three months. Okay, so we are issuing this on 1st April and the reporting date is 31 March. That is a full year. Okay, we are good to go. Okay, so the subsequent measurements, which will be at the end of the year, the subsequent measurement will be amortized cost. 
So what do we do that? This is just a one year. Don't go and be drawing the table. You don't have time. Okay. So what you do is that you have the balance as start. Balance as start. It'll be 3960. Okay, 3960. Then you have the finance cost. Your finance cost will be the effective interest rates. Okay, what is the effective interest rate? Okay. 7.9. 7.9. Okay, what we have to know is that if there is no transaction cost and there is no uh, premium at redemption, the question will always tell you that the effective interest rate is at the same as the nominal interest rate if there is no other cost relating to the transaction. It means that uh, the effective interest rate will be the same as the nominal interest rate. So 0 0.79 multiplied by 39.60. How much are you getting? Three one two point eighty four. Okay. Three one two point eight four. Mm. Okay. Three one two eight four. Okay. What will happen? Then we now pay the in we now pay the what the interest to those people. Okay. We now pay the interest, which is a coupon. The interest will always be the interest, the amount that we are paying to the holders. What is the amount that we are paying to them? Six percent of the four thousand. Okay, now give us how much? Two forty. Okay, two forty. So now zero point zero six multiplied by four thousand. That will give us two forty. Okay. What are we having as a total? Four zero three two point eight four. Four zero three two point eight four. Okay, so this is the closing balance to statement of financial position. Okay, I will show you. I will show you something. Okay, so let's come to statement of profit or loss extras. Okay, another statement of profit or loss. You can do this. Another statement of profit or loss. You can do this. You can have the interest. Okay, but what you are going to be showing is that you can show the finance score. You can you cannot have the interest of two forty. That is the actual interest that you are paying on the debenture. Okay, and you have the transaction cost or the amortization of the transaction cost to be 312.84 minus 240. What are you going to be having? Okay, so it means that 72.84 of the transaction cost has been what has been capitalized so you can you can just depreciate the two as that but what we normally do is that we we bring the we bring the distance we normally just bring the finance cost okay someone will be saying that why the transaction cost is 40 but the difference is what uh 72 the 72 is taking into consideration the premium. So the 72 over there is taking into consideration the premium that you'll be paying. The premium that you'll be paying is also an expense. So we are trying to what? Uh, spread the premium also. So that the 72 over there is also including the premium, which is what? 300 that you are going to be paying at the date of redemption. But what we normally do is that we just show the finance cost. Okay. We just show the finance cost of what? 312. Point eight four, okay. But you can you can you can separate it. You bring the actual 
interest or the dividend. That would be a dividend by it is interest because it's debt. So that will you bring the actual interest, then you bring the amortization or the premium part of it. Okay. So let's come to statement of financial position. We have a non-current liability depending on how long the instrument is going to take. Okay. Then we have non-current liability. Then we have a financial or you can just see preference, maybe six percent, six percent cumulative preferences, and that will be forty point forty thirty two point eight four. Nice but it's nothing big about the the financial. Liability. Let's speak a situation where uh, I've spoken about only if the shares are being issued at a at a discount. I didn't talk about premium. So let's speak a situation where the shares can be issued at a premium. What do you do? Okay, I will I will talk about. Yes, yeah, Senator Dennis. Uh, uh, the calculation, the interest, and the is that uh, uh, uh I want to take into consideration the month, the month, the number of months. Yes. Like no, that this is a full year. <laughs> it's April to March. Okay. Yeah, it's a full year. So I will just join our attention to the 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 year. The the instrument can be issued uh half year to the year end. So you have to take into consideration the year. But this is a full year one, April to March. Let's look at question question three. Hey. Is someone calling me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Hello. Question one is hundred thousand at a premium, or is it wrong? It is 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 not correct. Which one? The first one I saw. Is it three hundred thousand at a premium? This one. The premium is at the end of the year, so the premium has been already been taken into consideration. Ah, uh, okay. The effective interest rate. All right. All right. Question three, senior. Hello, sir. Yes, please. Hello, sir. Yes, please. I can hear you. Hello, I can hear yes, you. Sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, with the first question, yes, please. In the statement of uh, profit or loss, yeah, why didn't we include the interest? The interest, Intr is the interest that we paid, the interest we paid, the six percent. The interest is already part of this one, it's already part of the three one two. It's already part of the finance cost, yes, please. It is together with okay. the transaction cost and also the premium that will be paid at the end of the redemption. So that is why the first one I said that you can separate it. You can bring the interest separately and you can also bring the, so the interest, which is 240 over here is part of this one already. So you can decide to separate it. You are good to go. All right. Please, sir. Yes, please. Please, can you get to the initial recognition for me to see something? Okay, sir. Okay. Hello, hello, hello sir. Yes, please. Uh, please, uh, I had a network issue. H how did you manage to get the 4,000? Because 4,000 is not certain the question. If you can explain that one to me, please. We are doing, the shares are issued at at one CD and they have issued 4 million. So we are keeping three zeros. It should have been 4 million. We are keeping three zeros at the top. So that is why we have 4,000. Okay, thank you. Yes, Nagalaji. Nagalaji, take the last question for us. So that's, that's yeah. in line with IFRS nine financial instruments. Explain 
how the above will be accounted for in the financial statements of TIG for the year ended 31st December 2017. On 1st January 2017, Tamale Investors Group TIG issued 10% 200 million Ghana cities bonds on the domestic debt market. The bonds were sold at a premium of 20% of their nominal value. Transaction costs of 10 million Ghana cities were incurred. The coupon is payable annually in arrears. The bond must be redeemed on 1st January 2020 after three years at a discount of 1.33 million cities approximately. The effective rate of interest is 5% per annum. Okay, that, just stop. The, the, okay. the, the second one is, is, is financial assets. You know, we, are, we, are, we haven't done financial assets yet. So my focus is just the financial liability side. Okay. So let's only look at the financial liability side. Okay. They are saying that the, the bonds are issued at what? 200 million on domestic market. The bonds were sold at a premium of 20% of their nominal value. Transaction cost, transaction cost 10 million were incurred. The coupon is payable annually in arrears. The bond must be redeemed on first, first January 2020 after three years at a discount of 1.33. Please, whenever you are giving discount and premium, and that will be at the end of the year. Those things have already been taken into consideration in the effective interest rate. So if you apply the effective interest rate up to the end of the year, you will see that a premium or the discount will be coming. So you don't have to treat anything like that. The premium and discount is at the end of the year. You only take them into consideration if it's at the date of what? The issuance. Okay. So let's come to this one. We have the, let's determine the initial recognition. Okay, so we have the question number three, the TIG group. Okay, the initial recognition. Okay, so we have the purchase value or the issuing value. You can, you can mention it anyhow. Okay, or you can just write anything there. Just make sure that the value is 200 million. Okay. So the value is 200 million. Let's come here. They say this has been issued at a, at a premium of what? This has been issued at a premium. This has been sold at a premium of 20% of their nominal value. So what will be the premium? Forty. So the premium? Is premium an income or an expense? Income. 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 So if you are adding, if you are adding income to a liability, it means that that will be an addition, isn't it? Because the income is going to be having a credit balance. So you come to the premium here. The premium will be added because this will be having a credit balance. So if you are capitalizing, you'll be crediting the liability accounts. So we have zero point two multiplied by two hundred. Okay, and that will give us 40. So we have the transaction cost. Transaction cost to be how much? Transaction cost. 10. Okay. okay, 10. So transaction cost of 10. What will, mm. what will be the final? 230. Okay, that will be 230 million. So let's go to the, the subsequent measurements. The subsequent measurements will be your, your opening balance. Okay, it will be your opening balance or balance at start, which is 230. Then you bring the finance cost. The finance cost will be the effective interest rate. What is the effective interest rate there? 
five percent. Okay. Please, if you are giving, if you are, if the if the bonds are issued at a discount, discount is an expense. So the effective interest rate will always be higher than the nominal rate because we want to get a rate that will that will combine the interest together and also the discount also together. But if it is Please go ahead. okay, I'm saying that if the mm. the instrument is issued at a discount, you see that the discount is an expense and the interest is also yeah. an expense. So we the effective interest rate will always be higher than the nominal rate because we want a rate that can give us a discount portion and also the interest. But if it is issued at a premium, you see that the premium is an income, which will be reducing the, the interest. So the rate will be lower than the, what? The, the nominal rate because the premium is an income. So the income will reduce that. So the amount that you'll be getting should be lower. Okay, so you have the... 0 0.05 multiplied by 230. What are we having? 11.5. Okay, 11.5. Okay, then we come to the coupon, the actual interest that we are paying to the people as cash. That will be 0 0.1 multiplied by 200. Are we correct? Yeah. Okay. What are we getting? 90. Okay. Someone will be asking why the finance cost is lower than this one. It's because of the premium. The premium is an income. So the premium will be reducing this. So we have net the premium against the, all the expenses. And that is the final figure there. So what are we going to be having? Two, two, one point five. Okay. So we have 221.5. And that will be the closing balance to be taken to statement of financial position. So state Please, what from the coupon rate? The coupon rate is attached to the question there. The, the rate attached to the instrument is always the what the nominal interest rate. That is the interest that you'll be paying. And that is the 10% mm -hmm. 200 there. So we have a finance cost of okay. yes, please. So with the premium that is said as the pot, meaning we receive an additional 40 million from the people we issued out the, the bonds to. Exactly. You are selling. So if, if it is a premium, it means that the people are paying more than what they should. That is a premium. So that is an income to you. Asset. So it's been an income. Does that mean that we have to pay the, like we we'll have to pay something on it as an, as a liability on the okay. premium? We are not going to pay them anything at the end of the the maturity period. But what they are saying is that maybe the bonds is now, the bonds, the bonds is now maybe the bonds is having uh, a higher interest rate or something. But we are just trying to sell the bond at a higher price than we should. So the actual price of the bond is 200, but we are asking them to pay 240. It means that we are receiving an income of what? Of 40 on it. Okay. But since we are giving effective interest rate, it means that the bond must, uh, the premium must also be capitalized. But if you are not giving effective interest rate, we just spread the premium over the what? Over the maturity period. So they are going to be paying you the 40 in excess. You are not going to pay anything on it. The only thing that you can you can engage the transaction cost, which has been given to us. Okay. I don't know whether I've I've, I've answered your. Yeah. Thank you. If you can repeat that again, if you are you have been given a nominal rate. If you are given a nominal rate, the nominal rate. Okay. Assuming Hello? you are, assuming you are not given. Hello. Can I talk? Hello. Yes, you can talk. I can hear you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was saying if you can repeat that again. If you have been given a nominal rate and there is a premium and a transaction cost. Okay. But you said the transaction cost will be amortized if you have given a nominal rate. The same thing applies the to the premium. The same thing applies to the premium. The discount. Okay. Yeah. The premium is for is for three years. So you also you also uh recognize it over the 
Okay, so let's come to statement of financial position. We have non-current liability. Then we have 10% bonds. And that will be 221.5. All right. Senior. Yes, please. So, this, if, if you could send it back to the initial recognition, now I, I lost contact so I couldn't. Okay. Okay. The, the, business, the business model is for, we always use the business model for financial assets. Okay. So, uh, the, yeah, Roxy, the business model is always used for a financial assets. But for I've explained the business model where the question will be telling you that the people are holding this for speculative purpose or they are uh, holding this particular instrument for the long term. But for the financial liability, we just take into consideration the duration, the classification we just take into consideration the duration. Although they can say that they are holding it for speculative purpose, it means that that is for, they can sell it at any time. But for the business model, we always use the business model for the financial assets. The business model is how the company want to classify the instruments. So we always use that for the financial assets where if it is a debt instrument, the company is holding it for speculative purpose. They can sell it at any time. That will be classified with profit or loss. The company, they don't know what to do. So they are thinking of keeping it and they are also what are waiting for any better market that will come. So it means that they can sell before the maturity or they can hold it up to maturity. And that will be true other comprehensive income. And another business model is that they want to what, hold it up to maturity and receive all the cash flow. That would be true amortized cost. So we use it for the financial asset more than the words, the financial liability. So with financial liability, we look at the duration. Duration is the word, is the most important factor when we are what when we are classifying. Yeah, there we are. Thank you. Thank you very Hello, much. Sir. Hello, sir. Yeah, there we are. So I, I've realized that you see the uh, the coupon rate is higher than the uh, uh, effective interest. Is it because of the premium aspect or? Yes, it's because of the premium. The premium is an income. So it, it is always going to reduce the, what, the amount that you are paying. Deborah, are we, are we cool? Yes, sir. Thank you. OK. OK. Yes, yeah, someone is saying that uh, initial recognition. Initial recognition, the purchase price in the question is 200. This has been issued at a premium. We are selling at a premium. It means that we are selling more than we should. So we are going to be receiving 240 from these people. So that is why we added a premium. There was a transaction cost of 10 in the question and the transaction cost will be capitalized. Expense being capitalized to liability account will be a reduction. Okay. So then we come to the subsequent measurement, we now have our opening balance. We apply the effective interest rate on it. Then the coupon, which is the normal interest that we are paying. The actual interest that we are paying on the bond is 10% on the nominal value. Okay, if you go to the bank and you take a loan, the interest will be paid on the amount that you have taken. But since you, you are saying that you are using a standard, you are using a standard, then the, the bank will give you their interest rate. You will now come and calculate a new interest rate, taking into consideration any other cost that you have incurred on the what, on the loan. Why are you doing this? Because you are going to be netting the cost against the amount that you have received. So this is done in your books. 
but to the bank, you are going to be paying them the normal interest. So this is the normal interest that you'll be paying to, what, to the holders of the bond. And that is going to reduce. So you are just doing this because you are using what a standard to account for this. And this is what a standard says that you should do. If there is an effective, in, if there is a, a transaction cost, you should now estimate the, what, the effective interest rate, take into consideration the normal interest and the amortization of the interest cost. And that's what we have done. And our interest cost for the finance is 11.5. And our closing balance is what? 221.5 in the statement of financial position as a liability. All right. So please, any question? Any question? Okay. I should just take, no yeah. I should just take the silence to mean that we don't have any question. If there are no questions, please. I will see you guys tomorrow. Good morning. Good morning, senior. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Bless you, sir.